Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for another neuroethics uh, seminar. Um, those of you who are fans of the series will recognize that this is a topic that we have tackled from a different angle before. The title of tonight's seminar is Brain Hacking to Boost Your A-Game, The Ethics of Cognitive Enhancement in Gaming and Competition. Um, I hope you'll uh, appreciate that we've got uh, three very different speakers than we have bef uh, before when we, talk, when we tackled a, a, a similar topic. Um, and, uh, and we've got a great panel tonight. I'm going to introduce them uh, after I give a, th a word of thanks to our uh, sponsors, uh, in particular the Nine Brain Behavior uh, Initiative, uh, the Harvard Brain Initiative, and the International Neuroethics Society, which uh, allows us to webcast this. Uh, if you are watching via the webcast, please feel free to tweet us your questions. We've got somebody who will be monitoring uh, the Twitter feed. Um, use the hashtag neuroethics and tweet at us at, at HMS Bioethics. Um, our three speakers tonight, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce and then, I, and then I'll let them uh, jump into our topic. Uh, our first speaker is Anna Wexler, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Science, Technology, and Society at MIT. And uh, in particular, for our uh, benefit, she is a uh, visiting scholar this year uh, at the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, our second speaker will be Julian Sabulescu, who is the director of Oxford's Uehiro Center for Practical Ethics, where he holds the Uehiro Chair and is the director of the Oxford Center for Neuroethics. Uh, and then finally, Aaron Kesselheim uh, is an associate professor of medicine here and in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and he's an expert on regulation of medical devices, and he leads the program on regulation, therapeutics, and law. Um, after, after the uh, remarks tonight, we will have a dinner for anybody here who would like to attend. Uh, and I will give you directions at the, at the end of the evening. So please stick around uh, and feel free to join us. Uh, so first up, we'll have Anna Wexler. Thank you very much. focuses on the ethical, legal, and social implications of the home use of brain stimulation. Um, and today I'm really going to be talking about the social aspect of that, at least for this short talk. Um, and I think we'll hear from Julia more about the ethics and uh, from Aaron more about the regulation. So just as a bit of an intro, um, today we're talking about a specific kind of brain stimulation called TDCS, or transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, and it's a technique that provides a constant level uh, of electrical stimulation with a low current to the brain. Uh, and the most common way to describe a TDCS device uh, is as a battery attached to two wires. And at the end of each wire um, is an electrode. And when the electrodes are connected to the scalp, the uh, electrode electrical circuit is completed and the device is thought to deliver a current to the brain. Um, and it's thought that when the anodal or positive electrode is placed over a specific brain area, um, the region, uh, that brain region is in shows an increase in cortical excitability and the region under the cath cathode, um, there's a de decrease in cortical excitability. So basically it's a low level of current. It's not enough to actually cause the neurons to fire, but it's enough to modulate excitability, so basically either making it harder or easier uh, for the neurons to fire. This is uh, a picture of an individual receiving TDCS. Uh, and I think what's really unique about TDCS, um, especially uh, in the context that we're talking about today of the home use um, of brain stimulation, uh, one is that the device is not invasive, so it sits just on top of the head. Um, so it comes in contrast to other uh, techniques of electrical brain stimulation, such as deep brain stimulation, um, which are very invasive, they're inside the body. 
Uh, another feature that I think is <coughs> unique also is that the device is relatively easy to replicate. It's a battery uh, with two wires, uh, essentially. Um, and so again, it comes in contrast to other forms of, of stimulation. So for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation, <coughs> or TMS, uh, which is currently an FDA approved treatment for depression. Um, you see here, there's a pointer, there's a, there's different kinds of coils. That one in the photo there has, happens to be a figure eight coil. That's not really something you can say, make in your own basement. Um, so I think TBCS is pretty unique with those two things. So it's not invasive and, and easy to replicate. Um, I should also say that TBCS is not currently approved by the FDA uh, as a treatment for any indication. Um, so electricity has been used on the body for thousands of years, so dating back to the Roman times when electric fish uh, were used to treat things like headache and gout. Uh, electricity has been used through the 17th, well, I should say the mid 18th uh, century, 19th and 20th century. Um, but the modern uh, movement of what we would refer to as TBCS began about 15 years ago uh, when two German neurophysiologists, uh, Walter Paulus and Michael Nietzsche, published a paper um, showing that passing a weak electrical current uh, through the motor cortex caused human subjects to perform better on motor tasks. Um, <coughs> and this, I believe, it was 0.2 to 1 milliamps of current, so it was very low level. Um, electroconvulsive therapy, which many of you are familiar with, ECT, um, that's on the order of 500 to 800 milliamps of current, so that's hundreds, many hundreds of times more current. So today, TBCS research um, in the academic or scientific sphere breaks along two lines. So there's research uh, for TBCS in clinical populations, um, and that's looking at the effects of TBCS to treat various uh, medical and psychiatric disorders. And then there's research um, in healthy populations um, looking at the effects of TBCS, a learning memory, um, various kinds of cognitive enhancement. And uh, there's been about a thousand studies um, to date, and you can see really, these are this is a graph of academic journal publications about TBCS by year. Um, and you can see things have really exploded um, in the last five years in particular. So where did the home use of brain stimulation come from? Um, well, there seems to be isolated mentions of it, dating back to 2007, maybe earlier. There was one article in a magazine called The Phoenix, uh, which actually Boston Magazine, now they come. Um, and again, yeah, isolated mentions at various forums. Um, but things really seem to cohere in the middle of 2011, late 2012, when suddenly we see a number of blogs, websites, videos, all dedicated to what uh, has become known as do-it-yourself TBCS. And I think the, the late 2011, early 2012 start date is really interesting. <coughs> we want to place it in sort of a historical or contemporary historical context, looking back to see how it developed. And you see between 2010 and 2011, uh, academic mentions of TBCS really uh, more than doubled over there. And then if you uh, also look at a graph of the media mentions of TBCS, uh, you see between 2011 and 2012, there was a really big increase. So it seems that the media mentions of TBCS really increased around 2011, between 2011 and 2012. That's when we see this do-it-yourself movement come up, and that kind of lags behind roughly a year um, of academic mentions of TBCS. So who are these people known as DIYers? And I should say that's what they refer to themselves as. Um, and it's, it's actually not an easy movement to study because brain stimulation is a very private thing. Uh, often done in the comfort of your home. Um, and most of these individuals communicate on a Reddit forum, which is anonymous. Um, but there have been two recent studies, um, one conducted by Anita Dwa at Stanford um, about two years ago. So she did a quantitative survey of the community. Um, and I have also done qualitative work uh, interviewing members of the community, looking at websites and blogs related to TBCS. So, um, Individuals, both of us found that individuals are mostly male. Um, it's kind of hard to see on this, but um, they range in age from teens to late 60s, but there's a, a large percentage of them were, are in their 20s and 30s. The phenomenon is definitely a global one, although 
Uh, the Stanford study found that most users were concentrated in the US and Canada. And one interesting study looked at whether neuroscience researchers, or, or I guess any kind of researcher who studies TDCS, whether they utilize brain stimulation on themselves. And they found that for the most part, researchers who utilize TDCS were not stimulating themselves. So what is the purpose? Why, why do people stimulate themselves? Um, well, it kind of is interesting because it breaks along the same line of why scientists are researching TDCS. So you have um, stimulation for cognitive enhancement, for healthy individuals who are looking to enhance. Um, and you have stimulation for treatment. Um, people who are trying to self-treat a disorder. So this is uh, figures from the Stanford study. So that found that 59% <coughs> of people stimulate for cognitive enhancement, 11% stimulate for treatment, and 24% um, stimulate for both enhancement and treatment. Although I should note that the sample size was pretty small. Um, I didn't do a quantitative study, but my, my sense from my work was that the numbers for treatment may be, may be a bit higher. Um, and I know the topic of today's talk is about gaming and competition. Um, and we'll see a bit later that one device, uh, the Focus, when it first came out, actually marketed itself for gaming. Um, but use in gaming is not something I've seen be popular or become popular um, when I've looked at the home simulation community or what the people are using it for. Um, I think it's some, sometimes being marketed as a gaming device, but I haven't seen it that much, at least in video game or, or gamer communities. Um, so taking a step back, I think what's so fascinating, um, and especially for me coming from the science, technology, and society department, it's really exciting because what you have here are two groups, or I'd say at least two groups. Uh, you have researchers and home users utilizing the exact same technology, but just using it in really different ways, right? So you have researchers using TDCS in the lab, uh, applying TDCS to subjects uh, for research or experimental purposes. And perhaps most importantly, their use of TDCS exists in a very controlled and regulated environment. Um, you know, you have IRB, you have a lot of standards and a lot of regulations in the lab. Um, whereas DIYers or, or home users, uh, they're using TDCS at home, um, applying TDCS to themselves. Um, and whether they're stimulating for cognitive enhancement or treatment, it's self-improvement purposes. Um, but again, most importantly, it's in a completely uncontrolled environment uh, of their house, so they can really kind of experiment freely um, and do whatever they want, pretty much. So I've studied the interaction between these two groups, and I don't have a lot of time today, but I'm gonna share one thing that I've looked at that I think is pretty interesting, and that's where the DIYers or home users interact with scientific knowledge, or how they make use of published scientific literature. So when it comes to making or acquiring a device, uh, researchers can purchase, um, at least in the United States, can purchase one of two devices uh, that have <coughs> an investigational device exemption, an IDE, uh, from the FDA. The two devices that we can utilize right now are, come from Neurocon or Soterix. Um, DIYers or home users, on the other hand, um, don't have the research credentials to purchase these devices. Also, these devices are quite expensive. Um, it's not clear that they want to spend many thousands of dollars on, on a device. Um, so when they come to TDCS or they're interested in self-stimulating, um, there are a number of options that they have, and I'll just run through them very quickly. So on the left here, you can see that they can build a device. It's a little bit dark in the photo, but yeah. So there's a lot of schematics online for about 40 or $50. You can buy all the parts that you need and build your own device in, in your own house. There are TDCS devices and device kits. Um, these are often manufactured by people involved in the DIY TDCS world and, and community. Um, they range from 40 to 180, but they're, you know, new devices are constantly appearing on the market. I saw a new one today that I haven't heard of yet. Um, so they're constantly popping up. You have a number, and, and I should say that some of these devices make claims, so they're marketed for cognitive enhancement. Some of these devices make implied medical claims, and some of them make medical claims outright. Uh, I should say the ones in this column. Uh, there are other devices that are just marketed as either a TDCS device or as a direct current source. So now making that one over there is just marketed as a current source. Um, that's not marketed for TDCS at all. You have iontophoresis devices on this next column over there, and these are devices um, that physicians use. These are 
uh, used to treat, their current combining machine used to treat excessive sweating, hyperhidrosis, or uh, used to facilitate certain kinds of drug delivery. Um, but you can buy them for about $300 online and uh, repurpose them for use on the head. So one thing that's interesting is some, some scientists actually use ionophoresis devices in their own studies because they're much cheaper than buying the two devices I showed you uh, on the earlier slides. These are about $300, $400. So in some cases, you have researchers and the home users actually using the same thing, same exact device. Um, there's at least one device that's designed directly for TDCS. This is sold from uh, Hong Kong. Um, that's designed and marketed directly for TDCS. It's basically just a current provided machine. And then you have these direct-to-consumer devices. Currently, the only ones on the market are uh, Focus. That's up there. That's the one that initially came out. So that's a wearable headset that came out in uh, 2013. Uh, initially, it was marketed to gamers. Uh, now they've kind of expanded their marketing. Um, that's the older version. They now have new headsets. This is the version one. And the device, oops, actually I have it in my backpack. I forgot to take it out. The Faint device. Um, and that's a Silicon Valley startup. Um, it's a little white triangle that you can connect to your head, connect an electrode to it, pairs with your iPhone, and you either give yourself um, calm vibes or energy vibes. So it's marketed for mood enhancement. And I think one thing that's interesting when looking at all this is, you know, when D TDCS first began, or DIY TDCS first began, you saw a lot of these home-built devices and these device kits, but now it's really moving to these direct-to-consumer devices. So the range of devices are all over the spectrum. So one thing to keep in mind, you know, when we're going to hopefully get to regulation later is that there's a lot of variation in these devices. And you've, hear, you've heard me go between DIY and uh, home user, and I think that's because the border between DIY and direct-to-consumer, DTC, is really muddled. Like, this is clearly a do-it-yourself device, right? They constructed it in one's home, and I'd say that this is clearly direct-to-consumer. But these, some of these just kind of fall in the range of the spectrum because they require a certain amount of repurposing. So that's the range of devices. And and the overall, I guess, point here, or another one, is that when somebody comes and wants to stimulate themselves, you know, they're not involved with the scientific realm. So they're not looking to scientists for uh, knowledge about the kinds of devices. But when they apply TDCS, um, and when they use it on themselves, that's where they're really drawing on um, scientific paper. So they're all, they'll often post a scientific article post scientific articles on the forum. If it's behind a, a paywall, they'll post a free copy of it. Uh, they use video tutorials on electrode positioning that are geared towards scientists. Um, I found that they adhere mostly to certain scientific standards, like the 1020 uh, electrode positioning system that, that scientists use to figure out where on the head, basically standardized electrode placement on the head. Um, and for the most part, they do seem to adhere to this current maximum of, of two milliamps. They also uh, transform existing scientific literature uh, into these user-friendly indexes and guides um, that are geared towards their needs. So you have all these, so basically it's this one individual here, um, you know, instead of reading through these dense scientific papers and extracting the correct electrode uh, orientations that they want, they have these sort of user-friendly menus of cognitive enhancement options that you can browse and decide uh, what you want to get. Uh, another thing that I think is very interesting is that where there are unknowns in scientific literature, uh, DIYers experiment and share their knowledge. So session length and frequency uh, is one area where DIYers kind of really play and push the boundaries. Um, so it's interesting that scientists, you know, if you're getting IRB approval, it's not as easy to get IRB approval for, let's say, 60 minutes of TDCS if the going standard is 20 minutes of TDCS. But DIYers or home users can for however long they want. So I, I found that this is one area where they really experiment with the session length and frequency of sessions too. Um, and I love this quote um, from one DIYer who wrote on the, the Reddit forum, uh, most studies never measure the point at which TDCS stops working. And I think that quote really gives you an indication of where they're coming from and how different it is from where scientists are coming from. And uh, they also kind of extrapolate, if there's a study on depression, they'll extrapolate to treat their own bipolar disorder, let's say. Well, now I think there are studies on bipolar disorder, but when the first studies were coming out, they would just kind of extrapolate to treat their own disorders using whatever montages they found in the previous studies. So, why do we care about the social science aspect um, of this stuff? Why, why is it important to study the community? Well, one, I think it's, uh, it's important for scientists to understand how their second audience utilizes their research. So, 
fact that there are DIYers or home users reading these papers, uh, using them for their own uh, purposes. I think that's something that researchers need to at least be aware of and should maybe think about when they're when they're writing their papers. Um, I think that there are small kernels of value in these DIY reports. So uh, right now, there's a lot of talk about the future of TDCS and the potential home treatment for depression, um, but let's say supervised remotely by a physician. And if, if that's going to be the case, I think it may be interesting to look at these DIY reports and, and see what sort of obstacles these individuals encounter in their home use. So that's just one example, but, but I don't think that the whole endeavor should be readily dismissed. I, I think there is something to be gained um, by looking at what they're doing. Finally. Um, you know, if you think about proposing methods of engaging with, with DIYers or home users, the fact that they look to the scientific community for guidance, I think is a really interesting point, because that means that there's a line of communication open between scientists and DIYers. So there are other DIY or citizen science movements that kind of, uh, let's say, don't look to science, don't hold science in such um, high respect or high regard, and uh, DIYers or home users really do, and so I think that the avenue is open for scientists to communicate directly uh, with DIYers. And finally, I know um, Aaron is going to talk um, about regulation a bit more, but just one or two quick points. Um, I think social science is really important for assessing regulatory proposals um, because one, it's, I think it's important to look at the actual devices that are on the market and really take into account this variation in devices. Um, so right now, uh, the FDA only regulates drugs, those drugs and devices that are marketed for medical treatment. That's an oversimplification, but that's, that's basically the case. Um, so how the manufacturer markets its device or their devices are is extremely important. So a device that's marketed um, for, for recreational use or a device like the Think that's marketed for mood enhancement is not considered a medical device um, under the FDA, but a device that's marketed to treat depression uh, is considered a medical device. And uh, because of this, some people have said that there is regulatory gap or a lack of regulation. Um, the fact that the device I have in my backpack that I forgot to pull out, that pink device, um, that it's out there on the market, people have said, oh, there's a lack of regulation. Um, <coughs> but uh, and, and, uh, some people have said, oh, there's a lack of regulation. Maybe we should propose uh, additional regulation or modify existing regulatory framework. framework. Uh, but if we look at the existing devices on the market, uh, we can see that the proposed regulation would not, uh, would really probably only encompass a small sliver <coughs> of devices, right? Because it's not going to encompass the self-built devices. Um, it's not going to encompass any device that markets itself just as a direct current source. Um, it's not going to encompass ionotoporesis devices, which are legally out there. People just buy them and repurpose them. Um, a device like Think would actually, it complies with electrical standards. Um, it would probably pass regulation pretty pretty easily. Um, and regulation says nothing about the usage practices. So if we're concerned about, let's say, the safety of using a device like the Think for 24 hours a day, which I don't think people do, and I don't think there's a worry of people doing, um, regulation regulates the device, not, not the use of the device. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I think it's just this variation, and, and if we're talking about regulation and additional regulation, what is it actually going to cover, and, and that's just something to consider. Um, and more generally, I think we have to be careful when we talk about a lack of regulation or a regulatory gap. Um, I think many people have confused the lack of enforcement of regulation with the lack of regulation, and I think that's a really important point. So some of these devices, uh, especially here, do make medical claims, or they make implied medical claims. So just because the FDA, and, and so technically, they are medical devices, um, or FDA law or regulations. So just because the FDA hasn't enforced existing regulation against those devices doesn't mean that there isn't regulation. Um, so I think we need to keep in mind the practical nature of the law and, and of regulatory agencies. They can't possibly, so the FDA, for example, regulates all of food, drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices in the United States. It's a massive market, and they can't possibly regulate every single thing. So that's just a note about, yeah, confusing it's lack of enforcement with lack of regulation. And, and along those same lines, you know, a device like Think, I, I don't think it's correct to say it's unregulated, um, because if it's not a medical device, it's a consumer device. And there's plenty of regulation in the United States for consumer device. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission set safety standards for consumer products. 
the Federal Trade Commission uh, regulates unfair or deceptive uh, business practices, but it interprets deceptive very broadly, and it has recently taken action against a number of, a number of devices and apps that make cognitive enhancement claims. Uh, state authorities have also been involved. So I just think we need to be careful uh, when we talk about something being unregulated. I think, I think that certain agencies haven't enforced the regulations that these devices fall under. So just in sum, I think that um, people may have jumped to the regulatory question too quickly. So one of the questions to this panel was, um, should the FDA regulate think? And I don't know if that's the right question to ask right now, or at least the right question to ask first. Um, I think that we need to look at, you know, like brain stimulation, but you know, stimulating the head or brain with electricity makes us uncomfortable. I, I acknowledge that, I, I understand that. Um, but I think maybe the better way to approach um, this issue is actually looking at what are the risks? You know, what are we concerned about? What are the actual dangers? And what's the most practical way of addressing them? And what's the most feasible method that's really gonna address our so I think that may be a better place to start. Uh, hopefully we'll get more into that in the discussion. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, well thank you very much. It's, uh, I really would like to uh, express my gratitude to Bob Truog and TOS for inviting me uh, here today and to Harvard in general. It's a great opportunity to be back. Um, maybe I will respond to a couple of things that, uh, that Anna said uh, as we go along. Um, but one thing I will say is that I think she's correct. There's an enormous amount of information out there in the DIY community uh, that isn't being evaluated. It's a great source of research and uh, we actually, Roy Cullen Kadosh, my collaborator who does TDCS, received you know, questions from and, and requests to collaborate uh, from the DIY community. We actually pursued this and uh, the advice the university gave us was that we would expose ourselves to legal liability if we started to, which, is, which I thought was a great shame. Um, so uh, as, as Anna has alluded, the, the problem with with um, TDCS devices for enhancement purposes um, is that they are regulated differently to if they are marketed for, um, for medical purposes. So there's no control. Well, while she's correct that there are certain regulatory controls over anything that's marketed, um, there's no specific guarantee over electrode size, placement, stimulation strength, duration, etc. And the reason for that is that the FDA, and in this case the uh, European Commission, regulate according to the stated purpose of the manufacturer. So if you state that your device is for medical purposes, it falls within FDA regulations and it will be evaluated and it should be evaluated and, and there should be certain controls on it. But if you say that your device is for cognitive enhancement purposes, the very same device escapes the same level of scrutiny. Um, now, I'm not in favour of regulation in general, so it's uh, so I just wanted to get back in. Yeah, the, per the only purpose that, that we wrote this article is I think that people who use this device for enhancement purposes d deserve the same protections, level of information as people who use it for medical purposes. That's that's the simple claim. So um, by bringing it within some kind, by treating these, by ignoring purpose and treating the, the device as a device that delivers energy. Um, we thought that consumers would have a more reliable way of accessing a, an instrument with certain quality controls. Now, of course, they can make their own devices, as you said. They can, they can, they can do anything, really. Um, but those who want to use it with a level of certainty and safety can access it through this. So uh, we produced this policy paper for the Oxford Barn School, which you can download. Where we explored different models and gave justification. Uh, so I, we'll talk more about regulation uh, in, in the discussion. But I was asked to talk about uh, the ethics of using these devices for competitive purposes. So let me focus on that. Um, so obviously one of the main issues in, in, in the use of an enhancement technology 
uh, in any area of life are the risks. Um, and there are small, immediate risks, um, possible longer term risks, uh, variations between left and right handed people. But the main issue that I just want to draw some attention to is, is the issue that my colleague Roy Callan Kadosh and his um, collaborators shown is that improvements in one domain can come at a cost of impairments in another domain. So he showed the stimulation of the posterior parietal cortex facilitated numerical learning, whereas automaticity for learned material was impaired. In contrast, stimulation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex impaired the learning process, whereas automaticity was enhanced. So as another author said, it's <coughs> a little bit like pushing one piece of a complicated mobile. Uh, it may have inadvertent effects on other pieces. So although it appears to be very safe at the moment, we really don't know what the long-term effects are, and we don't know what the long-term trade-offs are. And for that, for that reason, um, we believe that it should be used as a research tool, and if it is used in, in a DIY community, there, there should be higher levels of safeguards than there are currently. That would be achieved by putting it under a medical devices directive. And the, the problem in, in the DIY community is, is worse. Okay, and... Um, there are a number of features of this that make it very interesting from an ethical perspective because it's so easy to perform and so easy to construct and it's very easy to use it on children. Uh, and these raise a number of ethical issues uh, in the community use. But I was asked to talk about enhancement and competition so after spending five minutes of my 20 minutes I'll get to that topic. Um, and, and this is a general talk because what applies to TDCS applies to any form of enhancement. Um, the arguments I'm going to give aren't specific to TDCS. And they apply to any form of competition. I think I was asked to talk about gaming. I don't know anything about gaming. I've never done one of those games, so I'll, I'll try to talk about it. But, but I talked, I've written a lot about enhancement in, in sport. It can also apply to chess. Um, so it's important first to rec recognise that there are huge numbers of enhancements in competition that are already permitted. Um, so creatine, intravenous nutrition, diet and supplementation, uh, technology in cycling, radio communication, painkillers in American football, anti-inflammatory drugs, many players end up crippled because of uh, uh, drugs used to enhance their performance despite injury. And caffeine used to be on the banned list uh, in, in, uh, in the Olympics. Uh, increases time to exhaustion by 10%. It's now off the banned list and, and is, a, is a legal enhancer. And surgery, uh, there is a famous elbow form of, of a ligament release surgery that I believe has been used in, in baseball. Now, in the enhancement debate, many people believe, and indeed much of the regulation is based on a distinction between natural versus artificial. So, if, if something occurs naturally like caffeine, uh, people tend to have a, a positive attitude towards it. If it's distilled into a pill, they have a more a negative attitude. If it's intravenously administered, there's still more negative attitude. In my view, the means of delivery has no moral significance. Um, what matters is the outcome or the process by which the, the, uh, the agent acts. So to, to, to give an example of this distinction in, in general, <coughs> Um, the use of human erythropoietin or blood doping is banned to raise the hematocrit, yet whereas hypoxic uh, air chamber or altitude training are forbidden. Both of them will raise your hematocrit from 45% to 49%. Uh, yet one is legal, one is illegal. Uh, so this distinction, I think, has been deeply destructive to thinking carefully about the principles that should govern uh, the regulation of enhancement in competitive activities. Okay, so what principles should we have? Well, the first principle is obviously safety. Uh, some reasonable level of safety. Now, in sport in general, the reason that athletes are not dropping dead today of the use of doping agents is they're engaging in what's called physiological doping. They're moving within a normal physiological range. They're moving the hematocrit within a physiological range. They're using testosterone and growth hormone within a normal physiological range. Uh, and that's quite safe because they're not using super physiological um, 
doses. Uh, when it comes to TDCS, uh, whether it's safe enough to be used as an enhancer, and it could be used for not only enhancement in gaming, but enhancement in the acquisition of motor skills, for example, in soccer or uh, other sports. Um, whether it should be permitted depends on its safety profile and its long-term risks. But actually, the data that we have makes it look pretty safe, especially when it's compared to the risks of sport. Um, I don't know anyone who's been rendered a quadriplegic from using TDCS, but there are plenty of American footballers, rugby players and other sports people who have been rendered quadriplegic. So when you hear this discussion about the safety of doping agents and performance enhancing drugs, it is incredibly safe compared to the inherent risks of sport. So uh, on, the, on the safety criterion, TDCS for the purposes of performance enhancement, although I've expressed some concerns, probably falls within the range. The second principle that ought to govern the use of enhancement in sport is one of fairness. Uh, and I was in a debate many years ago, probably nearly 10 years ago, with Dick Pound when he was the head of water. And Dick Pound, we, the debate was supposed to be, should we change the rules to allow performance enhancing drugs in sport? And Dick Pound, Dick Pound's argument, relentlessly was, we shouldn't allow it because it's cheating. It's against the rules. The precise topic of the debate was whether we should change the rules. Now, if the rules are easy to enforce, um, you could have whatever rule you want, it will create a level playing field. But where the rules are difficult to enforce because defection is difficult to detect, having those kinds of rules perversely creates unfairness because it enables the cheaters to gain an additional advantage. Now for this reason, physiological doping in sport is so difficult to detect because people are moving within a physiological range. So those who do dope are gaining an unfair advantage. It would be very difficult to detect the use of TDCS, uh, particularly because you'd have to have surveillance outside of competition. So any rule that attempted to ban something like the use of transcranial electrical stimulation to enhance performance would suffer the same fate as the current regulatory regime on doping. And that is, because of the difficulty of enforcement, there would be unfairness to those who stuck to the rules. So I've argued in the, the area of sport that we ought to revise our rules that both protect safety but allow better enforcement. So for example, in the area of uh, blood doping, set a hematocrit that was safe and easily measurable. Um, now, fairness requires enforceable rules to protect safety. And again, a regulated market where there were certain safeguards on electrode size, maximum current delivery, and so on, would enable the safe use of TDCS and a more liberal use. So again, by controlling safety, one can uh, achieve rules that are enforceable. Another objection that many people give to performance enhancement in sport is that it results in coercion. Unless you take that substance or form that practice, you're not going to be competitive. If you don't take steroids, you won't be able to compete in 100 metres. Um, now, it's a general feature of competition that freedom is restricted. You're not free to decide to compete without training. You're not free to be competitive if you don't take caffeine. And you're not free to compete if you don't want to take the risks. Whether these restrictions on freedom, these coercive effects, are justified turns on whether the activity is sufficiently safe. So again, if we can solve the safety problem, the question of whether coercion is justified or unjustified is resolved. Now, the third area that has dominated debate in sport is this concept of doping or performance enhancement being against the spirit of an activity, against the spirit of sport. So Wada defines the spirit of sport with this long list of idealistic virtues that you know, are interesting and, and aspirational, but hopeless for deciding what sorts of substances should be included on the ban list. What they really are attempting to get at is something about the human condition and achievement. Something about us that makes the achievement ours, 
that makes it distinctively human. Now, it's only a matter of time before the blades that Oscar Pistorius have used um, will outperform the normal anatomy of even the most elite runners such as Usain Bolt. In fact, they've already had to put a number of constraints on the use of that technology to mean that it doesn't outstrip normal human performance. And in my view, it was a mistake to allow Pistorius to compete in the able-bodied Olympics because of the domination of the effect of that piece of technology. So what Water is really getting at here is cheating in the sense of technology overtaking the, the, uh, the, the outcome. The outcome being dominated by the technology that is used. So Tom Murray many years ago had an example of people using roller skates in the Boston Marathon. So once a bionic limb or a blade starts to outperform, outperform normal human anatomy, the outcome is largely the result of technology. Now many people are concerned about doping in sport in general, that it will then be a race between pharmaceutical companies. And the use of TDCS would raise a similar kind of concern, that it's the electrical stimulation that is producing the outcome. Now, this kind of concern is not true of enhancements that augment training. Enhancements that increase recovery allow longer or harder training or protect from injury. And that's precisely how steroids work. If I take steroids, it will have no effect whatsoever on my performance in the 100 meters. And likewise, TDCS typically works by enhancing the effects of training. Simply putting on electrodes without engaging in training is not going to produce an enhancement benefit. So in that way, TDCS is like the <coughs> use of steroids. It, it requires the same kind of training, effort, struggle, and so on. What I do think is much more controversial is motivational enhancement has received very little attention uh, in the discussion of doping in competitive sport. One of the core qualities that we want from athletes is motivation, discipline and mental strength, striving and effort. So a machine that moved somebody's limbs in a gymnasium and caused enormous muscular benefit would be something that removed an essential element of the human condition. And in principle, TDCS could undermine this. I'm not aware of studies that have used TDCS to improve discipline and motivation, but that would be a controversial application. The use of TDCS to augment and accelerate the acquisition of motor skills, however, um, is not something that fits within this category. Interesting, analgesics and anti-inflammatory drugs do precisely this. They remove pain, struggle, and effort. Uh, on the part of injured athletes. The last criterion that I think ought to, uh, the last principle that ought to uh, govern how we think about the use of enhancements in sport is the idea of cheating in the sense not of robbing the human contribution, but of undermining the nature of the activity. Okay, now, none of you probably are aware of this game called cricket, um, but it's a game played in Australia, the West Indies, England, and so on. And the ball is normally bowled over arm. Okay, and it's uh, and uh, the batsman hits the ball, and if the ball goes outside of the stadium, they get six runs. In 1981, final of a very famous World Series game, Australia versus New Zealand, one all, last ball of the match, New Zealand needed six runs to win, so they had to hit a six. They had to hit the ball outside of the stadium. Uh, and this, this uh, man here, Trevor Chappell, the brother of one of Australia's most famous uh, cricketers, Greg Chappell, who was the captain at the time, instructed his brother to bowl an underarm along the ground, which made it impossible to hit a six. Uh, and this was widely uh, denounced as, as, as sort of undermining the sort of spirit of cricket. And in fact, the rules were changed. Um, so what this is getting at is undermining the essential nature of the activity. So I believe drugs like beta blockers that re reduce tremor and anxiety ought to be banned in archery, snooker, shooting, or activities that involve essentially a test of humans to control their anxiety or tremor. Um, likewise, 
Mike Tyson admitted to taking cocaine to, to, before many of his boxing matches. Cocaine will reduce fear and reduce pain. Fear and pain are a essential part of boxing. The use of those drugs, I think, undermine the nature of boxing. Now, fortunately, these kinds of drugs are very easy to detect because they're alien. Now, what, how, what is the implication of this for TDCS in gaming? If TDCS in gaming increases reaction time, this may well be something that undermines the uh, nature of that particular activity. So I've argued that enhancement in competition is permissible if it's reasonably safe compared to the background risks of life and sport. It's within the particular rules. It doesn't dominate the outcome and it doesn't corrupt the nature of the activity or the test of human ability. Now it's important here, I think, I'm going to finish now, to draw a distinction between training and competition. One way in which TDCS um, can enhance performance is by enhancing learning and acquisition of skills during training. Another way you can act is to enhance performance during competition, for example, by increasing reaction time. And in my view, the use of TDCS plausibly might be permissible during training, and indeed it would be very difficult to enforce any ban during training. But we may have reason to ban its use during competition if indeed it has effects that undermine the nature of that particular activity. So by distinguishing between competition and training, we may be able to have a more fine-grained approach to the use of performance enhancement uh, in sport. So sport and competition are human activities where we decide the rules. At the moment, in athletics and various other sports, the rules are zero tolerance to performance enhancement drugs in sport. No attention has yet been paid to the use of TDC and TDSCS in sport, but it will very likely enhance performance. And our attitude to that, I hope, will take a more fine-grained <coughs> approach than the current zero tolerance to the use of any external or artificial technology to enhance performance. Um, another area where it's, been, where it's likely to be used uh, is in the improvement of cognitive performance in examinations. Duke University has already banned the use of cognitive performance in cognitive, cognitive enhancing drugs uh, in that university, um, despite modafinil having been shown on a large meta-analysis to be safe. And we'll need to rethink whether TDCS is something that ought to be banned during examinations or not. If it enhances um, the ability to learn, but requires, again, as uh, any, any of the current enhancements, substantial human effort and training, it seems no different to the use of computing or information technology to enhance the effects of effort. Uh, so let me finish there. Inviting me. It's been a really interesting conversation, and uh, I'm looking forward to giving a little bit of commentary on this from a regulatory point of view. Um, I have to admit, not knowing much about TDCS before I started thinking about this uh, this conference, uh, but I think the conversation's been interesting, and hopefully, this uh, with you know my review of some of the regulatory and legal issues um, will add to this conversation, um, and you know, want to sort of maybe. Push back a little bit on on some of the some of the regulatory realism, um, and talk a little bit about what regulation offers in this area. So, let me just first start with uh, a little bit of why we regulate and why it is that the FDA regulates devices. And the answer is because of all of these quack uh, devices that uh, emerged over the past uh, hundred years. <coughs> prior to the FDA's regulatory scheme. Um, the devices in the middle are the Perkins tractors, which were supposed to work via some electromagnetic pulses. It's interesting, actually, in the context of what we're talking about today, that a lot of the quack regulatory devices on which the FDA regulatory scheme is built all involve you know, electromagnetism and, um, and affecting the brain waves. I mean, you, know, you can see the guy in the upper right-hand corner has his um, brain wave hat on. Um, 
you know, the drown uh, um, radionics device in the upper left-hand corner was transmitted radio waves from the doctor to the patient in their house. And when the, when the you know, the, the patient put a little bit of blood in the, in the device and then the, the doctor called and told them which, to, which device, you know, which knobs to move to which dials, uh, to which levels. Again, a very kind of DIY approach to treating illnesses at home with medical devices, all of which are complete and utter nonsense, right? Um, and actually, in the case of, of you know taking care of illnesses in these cases, harmed people um, because they were not getting evidence-based medicine. Um, instead, they were using these these false devices. And I think the question is whether or not um, you know where TDCS falls in the spectrum of all of these devices. I think it's also interesting that it seems like all three of us happen to pick this particular <laughs> advertising picture as one way of describing. Um, uh, displaying what a TDCS device is, and I think that also goes to the power of the, the question of why we regulate in this area, and the answer is because there are a lot of people out there who are using a lot of money in marketing to take advantage of people and to separate people from their money um, you know, in bad ways, and I think that that is, is the overlying, just, and in particular if it's dangerous, is the overlying justification for why it is that we can't just sort of throw up our hands and say, well, we're never going to be able to to get into everybody's living room, and therefore, um, you know, we don't, you know, relying on regulation in this area is a, is a is kind of a false promise. Okay, so I want to, in my short amount of time today, I want to talk about five considerations that, as I was thinking about this, uh, occurred to me as being uh, relevant to consider. Um, first, the FDA mission, and then the definition of what a device is, the implications of regulation, alternatives to regulation, and where we go from here. And I also want to try to make this a little interactive is a way of uh, stimulating another part of the brain. Um, so please uh, uh, answer, uh, let's try to make this as, as much of a back and forth as possible. That way I don't have to call on the two or three people in this room whose names I know. Uh, <laughs> and we can spread it around a little bit. So the FDA's mission, I think, is an important thing to start off by considering. Um, and this is actually in the US code. And um, uh, numbers three and four are a little bit uh, beside the point. But I think that numbers one and two are, uh, are most relevant to the issue here. Um, what is the thing that pops out to somebody most about what the FDA's mission is? Properly and efficiently. Properly and efficiently. I don't see that. Where is that? So that's, that's a few words in. What are actually the first few words? Public health. Protecting the public health, right? So the protecting the public health is the underlying goal, and it, and it, and it should uh, you know, invigorate whatever the FDA does, both in number one and number two. So the, the question, I think one of the essential questions here is, is there a risk to public health that TDCS uh, offers? And I think that that is still something that is very much up in the air. Um, but uh, you know, the FDA gets involved when there is a risk to the public health. Okay, so, and, and you know, does the FDA have authority in here? And there's been a little bit of discussion about whether or not the FDA has authority here, and so I think it's also worthwhile to think about what the FDA's definition of a device is. So, here's the FDA's definition of a device. A device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including any component, accessory thereof, that is recognized in an official national formulary of the pharmacopoeia, um, is number two, intended to diagnose diseases um, or other conditions or to cure, mitigate, prevent disease. Or number three, intended to infect the structure or any function of the body um, and which does not achieve its primary intended purpose through chemical action or within the body. So another question for somebody in the audience, does this definition seem to cover TDCS as a gaming or TDCS or gaming products like TDCS that can be used for gaming but can also be used for other purposes? Yes, I think very clearly, right? It falls here under the, uh, uh, even if, you know, I think that, that Anna was uh, brought up a lot of points where um, TDCS has been sold as an intent to diagnose diseases, in which case it would fall under number two. Uh, but in number three, it very clearly intends to affect the structure uh, and function of the body. And therefore, um, the FDA uh, has uh, de facto control over it. Now, whether or not they exercise that control um, is a different story. Uh, and the, uh, indeed, the Supreme Court agrees with the sense of the room. Um, and this is a quote from a Supreme Court case in 1969. Congress fully intended that the act's coverage be as broad as its literal language indicates, and equally clearly broader 
than any strict medical definition might otherwise allow in view of the well-accepted principle that remedial legislation, such as the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, is to be given a liberal construction consistent with the act's overriding purpose to protect the public health. So there's a reason that it was defined as broadly as it is, um, and the Supreme Court has recognized that. Now, in reality, uh, the goal here is that uh, again, it is, the question is whether or not it is intended to affect the structure or intended to diagnose. So first of all, again, this is from the point of view of a seller. So the idea here is that there is regulation over the market in which a product is attempting to be sold to a person. And the FDA uh, 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 determines this intent on the basis of the objective um, intent of the manufacturer. So the, and the intent is determined by the expressions shown surrounding the distribution of the article, including the labeling claims, the advertising matter, or oral and written statements. So how a, a person who is selling a device intends the device to be used um, through their advertising or marketing materials is, is, ends up um, leading to the FDA's control over the matter. There is an additional part of the, um, of the uh, regulations that will uh, allow the FDA to impute um, this kind of intent um, if the manufacturer knows or has knowledge of the facts that would give him notice that a device is introduced in interstate commerce and is then used for conditions or purposes other than the ones um, for which he offers it. So this is, you know, again, would, would theoretically cover um, in, uh, selling a device for one thing, you know, just as, hey, you know, it's a direct current, you do what you want with it. But if, you know, 90% of the people out there are using it for TDCS, then that could theoretically impute to the manufacturer knowledge um, of the use. Now I would point out that this is kind of breaking news, uh, um, this sort of third bullet down there, is that the FDA has proposed um, in the last few weeks to delete this rule from the, from the Code of Federal Regulations and to take this uh, imputed knowledge out of the Code of Federal Regulations in, as a way of deregulating uh, in this area. Um, but I would just point out that, that uh, this, this currently is on the books, that the knowledge provision creates this imputed intended use. Um, so what is, um, if we're trying to think about, if you're intending to affect the structure and function um, of, a, of uh, you know, the body, what is a structure or function claim that would impute this intent? And one way we can think about this is in the context of uh, dietary supplements, which are statutorily excluded from the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act due to a um, piece of fairly ridiculous legislation from 1994. Um, and are allowed to make structure and function claims, but are not allowed to make disease claims. So one of the issues in the context of dietary supplements is how to distinguish a structure function claim from a disease claim. I thought it'd be interesting to put this up here to try to explain what a, you know, sort of demonstrate what a structure function claim is. So among the first two of the top there, promotes digestion and relieves acid indigestion. Um, which of those is the structure function claim? Raise your hands. Um, do you, who thinks that promotes digestion is the structure function claim? Okay, and who thinks it relieves acid indigestion? Okay, how about the second one? Maintains normal bone density. Who thinks that's the structure function claim? And who thinks supports cartilage and joint function is the structure function claim? Okay, so you can see how this uh, eventually goes. Um, helps maintain normal cholesterol levels. Um, hands for structure function claim. Okay, provides relief of occasional constipation provides relief of chronic constipation, it supports the immune system, supports the body's antiviral capability. You can see how uh, you know, shades of gray this kind of distinction really is and how in the minds of a consumer, one of the things in the left-hand column may very well quickly merge into thinking one of the things in the right-hand column. But these are the kinds of distinctions that, um, that the regulatory system tries to draw um, successfully or not. Um, anyway, these are the structure function claims. Um, in each of these pairings. Um, as an alternative to uh, um, thinking about the structure function claims, the FDA put out a guidance earlier this year defining a general wellness product uh, in, in to explain what it does not intend to exercise its uh, a valid legal regulatory authority over. And the FDA has said that it does not intend to examine devices that are general wellness products. Um, an intended use that relates uh, and, and defined uh, a general wellness product as an intended use that relates to maintaining or encouraging a general state of health or, or an intended use that associates the role of healthy lifestyle with helping to reduce the, right, the risk or impact of certain chronic diseases 
Um, so, and some examples of what a general wellness product is that the FDA has said outright that they're not going to exert their regulatory authority over there. They give examples of a mobile app that plays music to reduce stress, or a pulse rate monitor for use during exercise, or a mechanical face exfoliation device um, as so-called general wellness products. Um, it, it, it would, it, it's also very clearly pointed out in this guidance that this does not apply to devices that, again, present inherent risks to a user's safety, such as invasive devices, products that involve an intervention that may pose a risk to a user's safety, um, raise novel questions of usability. So these are all, again, in the context of the FDA's um, oversight of the public health, or their, their kind of mission to protect the public health. If, if one of these general wellness devices in some way seems to implicate the public health, the FDA is actually going to exert its uh, regulatory authority over it. So what, in the same sort of vein, uh, spirit as the previous slide, what is a general wellness claim? And how do you distinguish that from a uh, disease or structure function claim? Okay, so can you name the general wellness claim? So in the first one, promotes a healthy weight versus treats obesity. So is uh, hands for people who think that the general wellness claim is promotes a healthy weight. Okay, so there's pretty good uh, uh, consensus on that. Second one, improves mental acuity, concentrating and problem solving to prevent dementia. Second one, tracks fitness to reduce risk of heart disease. Which one will the FDA uh, not uh, be concerned about? Anybody can <coughs> the first one for um, falling outside of the FDA's uh, um, this implementation of its authority? Hands for the first one. Hands for the second one. Okay, tough, tough one. Again, these are really, really difficult. And it, it raises the issue of, you know, how easy it can be to, um, you know, use uh, fancy words in, in marketing tools to try to uh, dupe uh, consumers and, uh, and, you know, patients into using products that um, have no real um, uh, efficacy and are potentially unsafe. So anyway, here are our general wellness claims <coughs> that the FDA would, uh, would exclude. Um, this is from uh, Anna's paper in the Journal of Law and Bioethics, um, which I thought was a great paper, and I would suggest that people download. Um, this is some examples of marketing language used in the, um, sa the sale of consumer TDCS devices. So charge your mind, power your mind, make your synapses fire faster. You know, are these wellness claims? Um, do, how closely do they shade into um, health and uh, st structure function claims? Um, or disease treating claims, uh, you know, such that we should be concerned about them and the FDA should be more um, closely, uh, closely overseeing, um, you know, the, the basis behind these, these, uh, these statements. Okay, so what are some of the implications of FDA regulation in this area? If a TDCS device is, um, uh, you know, officially regulated as a, uh, an FDA device, like it appears that uh, two of them might have been uh, approved in, or in some way or cleared in some way. I don't know if that actually is, is the case or if they're just, um, you know, being sold through more direct channels. But if, if you are a device that is um, regulated by the FDA, then you are required to have some good manufacturing practices in, in the, um, you know, con construction of your device. Um, and you are required to um, report adverse events that are reported to you by consumers to the FDA. And then there are the possibility of special controls that are specific to a particular device, including particular labeling requirements, mandatory performance standards, or they might even be a post-market surveillance program that your device is subject to by virtue of being under the FDA's um, umbrella. Um, devices are generally classified into one of three risk categories. Uh, and here they are. The first risk category are subject to basically general controls only, and these are the very low risk devices. And to get these on the market, you basically just have to tell the FDA that you're selling them and then, continue, then go off and sell them. Um, the second class are the uh, moderate risk devices, and these are subject to some performance standards. Um, and again, uh, you know, the, the um, and then the third class of devices are the highest risk devices, and these are the implantable cardiac defibrillators. The second one down there um, is a mechanical heart. You know, these are the highest risk devices that are used to, um, you know, sustain or continue, or, you know, sustain life. Um, and so, you know, where would TDCS fall in this classification system? Probably class two. They're probably not a class three device. They're probably a class two device, which is, which subject them to some um, performance standards oversight by the FDA. And you know, in order to get a, a class two device in the market, you do not have to actually do any clinical tests. All you have to do is show that your device is substantially equivalent 
um, demonstrate through some uh, you know, basic um, engineering test that your device is substantially equivalent to an approved device by, by demonstrating to the FDA that you have the same intended use, the same basic technological characteristics, um, such that the device has roughly the same safety and effectiveness as a device that's already on the market. And if it is substantial equivalent, then you file what's called a 510K pre-market notification, um, unless there, it turns out there's some sort of exemption for your device. Again, clearance through this 510K pathway for moderate risk devices rarely requires any real experimental or clinical data. And 98% of devices that are put forward through the FDA, of the four, three to four, three or 4,000 devices that are cleared via the 510K process each year, are cleared without any questions or changes after a relatively cursory review by the FDA officers. Of course, once your device is a cleared medical device, you are then subject to general FDA rules regarding you know, making sure that your uh, manufacturing practices are up to snuff, um, and, and, and in particular related to the promotion of the device in that you can only promote the device for the use for which the FDA has cleared it and not related to other um, potential uses of the device outside of that one particular, uh, one particular use. Um, that, that you had submitted. Okay, so then what are some of the alternatives to regulation? And well, one of the alternatives is, the, is what about the FTC? If the FDA doesn't act in this area, um, how about maybe, you know, maybe is, is there a sufficient regulatory oversight from bodies like the FTC or the Consumer Product Safety Commission? So look, let's think about the FTC for a second. The FTC regulates all consumer product advertising. So if you think it's a lot of work to regulate foods and drugs and cosmetics, then just try regulating all advertising, right? So you can imagine that here the regulation is even more thinly spread out um, than, than on the FDA. The Section 5 of the FTC Act prevents unfair deceptive marketing practices. Um, but you know, the question is, what is a deceptive marketing practice under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act? Is a, I'm sorry, under the FTC Act is a, is a, is a, a much lower hurdle um, than under the, uh, um, F, the, the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, even as it relates to, to medical devices. The FTC uses the standard of competent and reliable scientific evidence if you're making a health-related claim, um, which is lower than the, than the standards used for um, drugs and, and some medical devices. Um, and you know, in, the, in particular, the, the FTC has been um, ha you know, getting in some legal trouble recently by trying to impose higher standards in the context of uh, health claims made by certain juices, uh, pomegranate juices, and um, uh, some of the courts have, have come down on the, on the FTC for trying to impose high scientific standards for meeting this competent and reliable evidence. So the question of what competent and reliable evidence is, um, is a pretty vague one. Anyway, so overall, the FTC standards are more lenient than the FTA, FDA, um, also in part because of the goals of the FTC are different than the goals of the FDA. The goals of the FDA are to protect public health. The FTC is worried about consumer deception. So the FDA will act um, in the context of protecting unwary and vulnerable consumers from rapacious and unethical businessmen, the FTC won't necessarily because you know this is the, the marketplace, and if and, you know if you um, make uh, bad choices in the marketplace, um, even though you know things are theoretically clearly laid out for you, the FTC isn't going to be as concerned uh, as, as concerned for you as the FDA will. So I think the FDA in general is a better regulatory oversight ambit for these sorts of uh, devices. So. So here are my conclusions, um, and then uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Um, but uh, so TDCA for gaming probably falls under the Food Drug Cosmetic Act definition of a medical device, um, given the what we don't know about the what we know or don't know about the safety of, of TDCS. It's unclear whether or not the FDA would prioritize regulation in this space unless there is evidence of public health harm. Um, there really is no scientific reason that manufacturers of these devices should fear the FDA or should fear science. Uh, and the need to prove that their devices actually do the things that they're claiming to do, um, you know, through re real randomized blinded studies. Um, I think that the, 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 the fact that they do uh, suggests a lot about their underlying confidence in these devices uh, to actually do the things that they do. Um, and by the way, the FTC oversight of marketing claims this alternative is not likely to have um, much teeth in this area. Thanks, everyone. Can I just have our speakers maybe join us uh, up at the front? We're going to have, uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I'm not going to bring around a handheld mic for everyone to use. Uh, in this room, if, if you just speak up, uh, we'll pick you up on the mic so you'll be heard on the webcast. 
I know that Anna had some uh, questions or some comments that she wanted to raise about regulation, but let, maybe I could take the first crack because, uh, Aaron, your, your remarks uh, raised some thoughts for me. So as a, as a neurologist, I'm not particularly worried about the risk of these TDCS devices. Um, but I am concerned about the possibility of diverting people who need therapies from therapies that are known to be effective. And I'm particularly worried that uh, people with psychiatric illnesses could read some of these wellness claims of the manufacturers and think, okay, well, this would be a better way for me to treat my disease than cognitive behavioral therapy or medications which are shown to work. Um, and so then I was reassured when you first said that, you know, one of the roles of the FDA is to prevent that type of harm. Uh, but then my despair sank in again as, as you mentioned that they're, that they're considering removing that, that knowledge condition from the manufacturers, right? So it seems, it seems clear to me that that's a, that's a potential risk of the way they want to market these things. Um, and, that, and that they will know or they should know that it's happening. And if the FDA doesn't require them to respond to that risk, um, it seems like we're opening up the possibility uh, of harming people in that. Maybe that's a narrow population, but maybe it might not be a, too, all that narrow. Yeah, I could have said it better myself. I think that that's, uh, I think that's right. I think that is a major concern. Um, and I think that uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why you do want to have a scientific regulatory body like the FDA that is skilled at determining what kind of studies are necessary and what you know and how to evaluate the evidence and I think that that's why you want to have that sort of a, an organization um, overseeing uh, you know the, the, this kind of possibility I mean again you know if you're talking about devices that are outside of the ambit of, uh, of health and wellness of, of sorry of health and uh, medical care um, you know then I think that the, the concern is less especially if those devices are safe um, and, uh, but I think that there remains questions on both of those issues that we just don't have the data on. Um, you know, we don't know if they're safe, um, as, as Julian pointed out, um, and, I, and we don't know how these devices are, are being used and whether or not these um, advertising claims are, you know, appropriately communicating the, the risks and benefits. Anna, did you have a comment or question regarding regulation? Yeah, just to, just to respond to what you were saying. I, just at least from what I've seen in the um, itself, I don't see people going to them as a first line treatment for now. And I think a lot of the, the manufacturers, again, are careful not to make these big medical claims. And so I haven't seen people going to them as a first line of treatment. And, but I have seen a lot of people who have struggled, who at least write about on the forums and people I've spoken to, who struggle with depression for many years. None of the drugs are working for them. And then they decide to try to do yeah. So it, things might change, but I, but I could say now that's, that's definitely not. Well, shouldn't there also be special considerations made if it is being used a lot by people with psychiatric problems that perhaps this is a more vulnerable population than the people who are using it to play video games and that the potential diversion would be something really important in that those people could be more risk or less risk averse in you know using it for longer than other people have told them to do because they feel like maybe it has done treatment and it hasn't worked. Do you, do that? Do you mean special regulatory consideration? No, or? I just mean, I like, is that a, a yes, sort of? Is that, like, wouldn't that inform considerations of the ethics of it around just protecting that group? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe. Well, I mean, it's similar to the usage of yeah. parents on children, parents using it on children. So this is uh, um, one of the really big problems of this sort of technology that it's difficult to control how it's used. So embedding some kind of design protections, I think, would be a useful thing to do to limit you know, the numbers of treatments, amount of current, and so on. But I mean, the, the use in children is going to be, I think, even more problematic than in a psychiatric patient. Alvaro, and could I ask folks who want to ask a question just to introduce yourselves as you as you start your question? Yes, I'm Alvaro Urology and Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this was great. Thank you. Uh, I, I just had three quick comments or, or questions that we just said. Uh, 
first, in regards to the safety, I, I, I wouldn't say as a neurologist I'm not concerned of the safety. I'm very concerned of the safety about the safety because I, I think there are lots of things we don't know the, the body. And one of them to, to, to my mother is this mm -hmm. cumulative dose. We have absolutely no idea what happens over a lifespan with this with these interventions, um, or even where to look because of the potential risk of, of the different impact. Um, uh, that includes um, the, the question of, of combining it with training, which I think is really, I agree, it's different than doing performance, but, but it raises at least the question that, that you could, things that we know we can decrease with TDCS is, for example, um, the optimism bias. So, so if you decrease the optimism bias, or, or even better, if you increase it, if, would people be more willing to train in a more risky way and because of that, increase the risk of the game <coughs> that they are playing because of the way that they're playing it differently. And, and so, um, so I think safety is still a very uncharted territory in, in all its, its domains. Um, the, the, the second question I had uh, was in from it was in regards to fairness that we, we know that there is a very different effect of TDCS on different individuals on the basis of genetics, on the basis of state, on the basis of what they just did. Uh, on the basis of what they're expecting to do afterwards. So um, we know, for example, that smart people are made smarter because of this state dependency effect, more so than those with low IQ. So uh, could TDCS in a bizarre kind of way be a way to create, or brain-based modulation, a way to create greater inequality rather than uh, having to do with, with that in, in some regulation? The final point that actually uh, wanted to to have you guys discuss, but, but you were just starting to talk about it. I get literally daily calls uh, from from patients, uh, parents, uh, telling us uh, about the TDCs that they're doing on their kids. There are <coughs> huge clinics in the United States treating autism with, with TDCs on kids. Uh, there are two clinics doing TDCs in persistent vegetative state. Uh, in, uh, I'm talking scaling. I don't know that there is any regulation to this uh, that, 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 is, that is really applicable, and I. Um, do, I, I, I do you mean the it. clinics using it as an off-label treatment? Or yeah, it's an off-label treatment okay. of an approved device, a side of the device. Right. Yeah. And they're not, and they're not doing it as, as part in the context of a study. They're not studying their own use no, of no, the device. They're charging somewhere between two hundred and five hundred dollars per session, and doing somewhere between ten and thirty sessions of treatment. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, I'm working on a project about the off-label use right now because I think it's a very big issue. So, so basically, um, yeah, off-label means taking a, a device approved for one indication and using it to treat another. Um, but I, so basically, people are taking iontophoresis, and you could jump in on the resolution side. But but people are taking these iontophoresis devices, which are approved to treat excessive sweating or for drug delivery, and basically using them on the head, um, on the brain, for cognitive enhancement and for treatment. Um, so I'm actually looking at all those different clinics right now, and I think that's a real stretch of the off-label. I'm in the beginning stages of this project, but yeah, I think that's a really important point, and that's that's a big issue, and I think when people criticize the do-it-yourself community um, and home users, I think that this population of accredited physicians who are using these treatments does not receive the same level of scrutiny, and I think if we want to be consistent in our critique, that I think we need to apply that. Sure. I, it sound, that sounds like a great study. I would send it to, to New England Journal or JAMA when you're done with it because it sounds like we really need that kind of uh, knowledge out there. Um, you know, I, I think that it's probably most people in the room know that the FDA doesn't uh, regulate the practice of medicine and that off-label use of drugs is very common and off-label use of this device in this case obviously is, is growing in, in, um, in, its, uh, in its scope. Um, but you know, the FDA doesn't, at least as we sit here this minute, and there are a lot of challenges in the courts about this, the FDA doesn't allow devices to be promoted for off-label uses. And what uh, we have seen time and time again over decades and decades of, of experience is that promotion of, 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 product, of products for off-label uses in, in incredibly enhances the use of the product in those ways. And so um, I think that it would be a mistake 
to take a, to think about the fact that stuff is being used off label and then to say well we, this is a, a call for less regulation I think that we should enforce the regulation that's on the books and if um, you know if the FDA doesn't have the scope of legal authority to get to these uh, cases and you know I think it's also prob probably the case that there are is some uh, you know off-label marketing that is done through um, under you know subtle ways that the FDA could probably investigate um, you know then we have to turn to professional societies and other ways of trying to you know manage um, you know maverick physicians who are potentially harming you. Can I just comment back for a second. Uh, so so I, I agree that that's a big issue, but it's nuanced, right? Uh, so so uh, I don't think that it's all maverick physicians uh, doing it. I think there are people appropriately extracting knowledge from the literature and from meta-analysis of offering it to patients where it's an appropriate use of the sure. medical device with appropriate oversight. So well, I mean, I think that the biggest response to that is just to get data. I mean, I think that if there were actually studies in, in those circumstances and if there was funding for those studies, um, and if a lot of these companies that were you know, making so much money off of these devices were actually funding studies of the devices that, that, uh, that they're being used, then we would figure out in what circumstances these kinds of things work and, and what they don't. Unfortunately, you know, I think enough people are, are happy making you know, just kind of money in the short term that they're not thinking about that. You know, thinking along the, the same direction, you know, uh, one thing we do not know is that how much passive effect and how much psychological dependence of the device and after long-term exposures. And you know, from the in epidemiology perspective, you know more than I do, that you know, for short-term exposures versus long-term exposure, you know, the devices are very different. I did uh, some work at the uh, Johnson & Johnson and Sanofi you know, about the drug device combinations. I trained as MD here. But my impression is that um, we need device as an option, you know, uh, in addition to the medications. For instance, I uh, year to control, compulsive shock, you know, versus antidepressants, also compared with the current McKinn study on these uh, year to magnetic stimulations. They are all different modality, and I prefer, you know, more options. But I agree perfectly with you. The panel, you know, we need the long-term safety, you know, surveillance and monitoring. Yeah, um, we do. And, and just to speak to your first point, I, I think that there's been a lot of talk about safety and risk, and, and I think that a lot of things are getting locked into this word safety. And, and you made this distinguish, uh, you distinguish this on your slide, but we have the short-term effects, the acute effects, uh, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then there's the long-term effects, which are really unknown. Um, so along the lines of the short-term effects, you know, what we do know is in both TPCS uh, studies and with the home users, I mean, you get redness, tingling, itching, fatigue, maybe nausea in some people. But um, I don't know if they, and again, this comes down to your question of whether this is a public health risk. And I, I don't know. I, I think I mean, this is a good example of why we need to rethink research ethics because you can't do a long-term study of TPCS. You can't do a long-term study of pharmacological cognitive enhancement. What you need to do is go out there in the community and use every person as a data point and audit what's happening. But ethics committees won't allow you to do that. And that's crazy because the data is accumulating. We could be using it. And we could be seeing what's happening, and, and that needs us to, and this is going to happen more and more as yeah. users as take control of what they're doing. And if they do that, we may as well, as systematically as we can, get data from them. And it's a great missed <laughs> opportunity. Yeah, and, and the way to do that would be to bring it within the FDA system, because then you have adverse events reported to the FDA. You have a structure for knowing, you know, for having uh, certain devices be you know, uh, associated with certain um, you know makes and uses, and you can sort of start to systematize the data. I, w I guess I would disagree that you couldn't do a long-term study of these of these products. I think you probably could figure out a way of doing that, but you know we don't have to wait necessarily on that uh, to start to collect data on the uh, on the uses that are already out there. But but to the short-term effects point, there there has been no hospitalization instances that I'm aware of, and. and TPCS literature, uh, there was one recent review came out saying that in the 10,000 um, subjects studied so far, there's been no adverse event. So in terms of public health risk, I mean, nobody's shocking themselves to death. Nobody has died from this. And to my 
knowledge, nobody has been hospitalized. So just to, just to sort of keep that in context. Yeah, can I address that one? So sure. Bruce Satter Children's Hospital, and I develop treatments for other diseases, and maybe I take a little bit of a less is more approach when it comes to regulation, um, and I knew nothing about this when I came into the room. So what I heard is that there are a lot of people out there using it, there is some research going on, maybe it has some demonstrated positive effects in some things, and maybe there's potential for abuse later on. But what I've heard is probably potential, maybe, for harm, but no demonstrable harm. And so I worry about jumping to regulation at a time when there's no demonstrable harm. So I'll just throw that out. I agree with that, and also I think we need to see, you know, what are what are the risks here? What is the potential demonstrable harm, and how exactly would regulation address? If regulation would address that, for those who propose it, how would regulation work like that? And are there alternative methods? So people have proposed an open engagement approach. So um, actually interacting with the community, um, publishing things that give the community guidelines about what's known and what's not known. Um, and I think <coughs> that could be a much more flexible approach. It's more fluid than having regulation or having something that really doesn't fall into the medical device structure now proposing some way that it would somehow get into the medical device structure. I mean, so, yeah, so I, I, I completely agree. I well, think I think there are issues, but I think maybe regulation... I agree with way. you. So to take, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't like regulation either, but you're delivering energy to the brain, and you're going to do it for a long term. And we've already shown that there, I tried to sort of quickly allude to this, there are some downsides. You can impair learning, uh, you can also impair performance in one domain when you improve in another. So it's not a straightforward, you know, getting your ears pierced intervention. And I think at the FDA and, and the European Devices Directive gives you a high level, the consumer, a high level of protection in terms of quality of information, uh, the kind of the structure of the device and so on. So in that sense, I think that while it's in 10 years' time, if, if it pans out that there aren't any long-term effects, you know, I, I agree. But at this point, I think we ought to err on the side, not of restricting access, but in ensuring that people know what they're doing. So get, getting back to your very interesting point about increasing optimism, I think, it's, it, I think this is going, these sorts of effects, motivational effects, effects on desires, this is going to be much more challenging than affecting your numerical ability or your ability to remember things. And there I think you need to really know what the risks and benefits are to make sure that you decide that's what you want to do. Uh, and so you, you really need a much higher level of information that you'll get with the, the usual product disclosure as you see through the, the lower level of regulation you have here. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is a fantastic experiment that we should let run <laughs> and see what happens. But I think that we, we ought to have some control over information, auditing of effects, and structure the experiment in a much better way than we are now. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I would agree, and I would only add that the fact that we don't know of any hospitalizations in a community where um, nobody knows about anything does not reassure me that this is a safe device. It, it, it inspires me, it, like I'm not a neurologist, but it seems like this is a potentially unsafe device from what it does, and it inspires me to want to gather more data on this issue and not to throw up my hands at regulation right now as something that will just impede our access before we know one way or other what it does. So that, that, would, that would be one. Uh, two, two more questions. One is, can you tell us comment on the basis of evidence for there's two there's two meta analyses, um, and one of them shows an effect, and the other one doesn't. But the studies the, the studies are so poor. Some of them are just a one-off, you know, intervention, and they're included in the meta analysis. Uh, so from the group in Oxford, Roy's shown quite striking effects on on improving numeracy children with dys dyscalculia. So there have been studies that have shown quite striking effects. When you pull all of the studies, because they're so variable, uh, and, and some of them are only a single episode of TDCS, the effects look quite weak. But my reading of the evidence, and maybe you know, my clinical colleagues will have a better impression, is that it really does have an effect in certain conditions. 
conditions uh, so far. Um, do you have any, is that your take on the data so far? I would agree exactly with it. Yeah, I think there is, there is very good data and really solid effects and good controls. And generally, underpowered small studies, certain good principal studies. <coughs> aggregate across multiple studies, it washes out because the study design sometimes has to make it more. A lot of studies with small sample sizes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my colleague's, my colleague's statement is it's still an experimental technique. That's and it should be, it should be, you know, viewed as an experimental technique. And you know, and he's at the sort of cutting edge of it. That's why I think once you move to this DIY use. I'm not sure that people really realise that it's purely an experiment. I mean, they look, they find a study that shows an effect, and they say, "Well, it's going to improve my memory." And you know, we're a long way from that. So, the second question: if, if it turned out to be effective, or if there was another similar technology that was effective, I was I wanted to ask you particularly why you thought that a device that affected. Um, pain tolerance, for example, would be undermining the sport, but, but not, or a competition, but not a device that, I don't know, enhanced uh, benefit from training. It, 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 it seems like they're, they're both affecting attributes that are very helpful in the sport. Well, what, well, as you've seen in American football, if you remove pain, you increase injury, and, and, and so it's unsafe at that level. But also there, and again, what you think sport is, is up for grabs. Um, but you might think that a part of sport is dealing with the pain of participation and giving people anaesthetics or local anaesthetics prior to participation is you know, removing something that is essentially part of the struggle. Now, you could take a different view. You could say, well, you know, we don't care about the pain. We just want to see the performance. And we want to see as excellent a performance as possible, and we don't care if the person ever walks afterwards. Sport's arbitrary. Uh, it really is up to us to define that. There isn't any deep, there is, and this is the mistake people make in, in anti-doping legislation. There is no kind of deep set of right principles that govern sport. It's anything that we want. <coughs> and it's just what do you want? It, what sort of sport do you want? Um, where I said recovering from injury, you know, I remember um, Ben Johnson, uh, the first high-profile anabolic steroid, you know, Seoul Olympics, won the hundred meters, ran nine point eight seconds. Um, he said on radio, if you want, if you want a human being to run under ten seconds, you have to do so much training. You will have injuries; they are inevitable in that training. And in order to recover from those training you have to take steroids. There are 10 people who have um, run under 9.8 seconds or under. Only one of them has no doping allegation hanging over their head, and that's Usain Bolt. All the other nine have either been proven to be doping or had serious doping allegations. You don't run low speeds without getting injuries. So we want, we want to see people breaking 10 seconds. You want to see people breaking 10 seconds, you have to be on steroids. We are about five minutes past, so I want to thank our speakers once again. And if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, please join us for dinner. Again, the room is 304, so there are stairs uh, out in the atrium, it's fairly obvious, uh, or some of us will, who know the way, can lead you there. Thanks a lot.